Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Joining us here at the command center and joining us virtually, my name is Paul Katavalua and I'll be the MC this morning. I welcome you to the 50th John Sebana Chizito Memorial Lecture being held today at the Insurance Training College. So the CEO IRA joining us here online, chairman and members of board of ITC, the CEO of IR ITC, our keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Kasenene, the family of the late John Sebana Chizito joining us online and are uh, here present, represented by the Swiko family. Our partners, our online delegates and participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We again welcome you to the fifth Honorable John Sebana Chizito Memorial Lecture. The gentleman in whose memory we are holding this lecture has been a great pillar, or was a great pillar to the insurance sector. He's renowned for co-founding one of the indigenous insurance companies, statewide insurance company, together with his other partners and interstate insurance services. He was previously the chairman of Uganda Insurance Association. He was a sportsman, an academician, and a politician. So in summary, we can say he was a jack of all trades and a master of all. I request that we, mo we maintain a moment of silence in honor of the late Honorable John Semana Chizito. May his soul rest in peace. As highlighted, this is the 50th memorial lecture. The late John Sebana Chizito passed on in 2017, and upon his demise, ITC resolved to honor him. And in 2018, we held our first memorial lecture in honor of the late Honorable John Sebana Chizito. It was held in August and it focused on the future of the financial services sector in the rapid changing global environment. We are privileged then to have the CEO of IRA as our keynote speaker. The year after, that was 2019 in August, again we had uh, another memorial lecture which focused on the emerging trends in the insurance sector and again we were privileged to have Madam K. Patti Martin, who is the CEO, chairperson of the OSI board, presenting as a keynote speaker. Again, to the college, we are honored to have OHT Charles Peter Maiga as the guest of honor. Thereafter, in 2020, we again held another lecture, which focused on business recovery and continuity amidst the pandemic and we are focusing on the role of insurance. That one was, was, was unique in a way because it was held in Luganda. So there we are looking at Insua, Eyambe, Etia, Esobozi Setia, Obusobozi Ne Business, Oksigalanga, Bito Jira, Mombera Za, Zechirwa Decha COVID-19. And again, we had industry captains making the presentation online. Last year, 2021, we focused on resilience of business enterprises, focusing on a reflection of insurance industry. And then we were also privileged to have Mr. Emmanuel Katongole as a keynote speaker. We also had key pan panelists like OHT Wawagwan Sibirwa, the second deputy prime minister, and then industry representatives at that event. Today, we are holding the fifth and it is focusing on insurance, wellness, and health. And like I earlier said, Dr. Paul Kasenene is here to take us through this session. Dr. Paul Kasenene is not alone. We are also going to hear from uh, other members as I will present during the program. But what I want to emphasize, holding the fifth to us is an achievement. I remember during the very first memorial lecture, Al-Hajj challenged us 
to continue holding these lectures and I'm glad that seeing the fifth year running and we're holding this, to us it's, it's a no-minute achievement. Our program is going to run as follows. We are going to officially open this session with a prayer and Ruth will be leading us in the prayer and then the anthems. We shall have the welcome remarks by the CEO of ITC, Mr. Saul Seremba. We shall have an address by the CEO of IRA, Al Haj Kadunabi Ibrahim Lubega. We will then f look at the resolutions or highlights from uh, the previous lectures. We are privileged to have Mr. Solomon Lubondo, who has been part of this journey all the way, to take us through that. We shall have a brief by the Honorable John Sebana Chizito family. In here, we are looking at uh, the family represented by Suiko. And then uh, we shall dive straight into our program, I mean our theme for the day, Insurance, Health and Wellness, by Dr. Paul Kasenene. We shall have a Q&A session and then close the session. So we are hoping that by 11 sharp, we should be able to close this session. Ladies and gentlemen, I once again welcome you and I invite Ruth to lead us in the opening prayer. Thank you. Good morning. Um, let us humble ourselves and pray. Almighty Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for bringing us here together to remember your servant, John Savannah Chito. As we deliberate and learn, may you be with us. Guide us in all that we shall do today. In your name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Ruth. It is now my honor to invite the CEO of ITC, Mr. Saul Seremba, to give his remarks. Thank you. Hey, sorry. Anthems first.
Thank you very much. It is now my honor to invite the CEO and principal of the Insurance Training College to address us, Mr. Sol Seremba. Thank you, uh, Mr. Paul Katabalwa. Our regulator, Alhaj Kadunabi Ibrahim Lubega. Our dear keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Kasenene. The board of the Insurance Training College of Uganda the board and CEO of SWICO, our esteemed partners, the family of the late Savannah Chizito, our dear participants joining us physically and virtually, good morning. Uh, today marks the fifth time we are holding uh, a memorial lecture in honor of the late Honorable John Sebana Chizito. It indeed gives us immense pride that this lecture has now become an annual flagship event of the insurance sector. As you are aware, we chose to celebrate Honorable Sebana because of his immense contribution to the growth of this sector in the different ways that he did. He played a very big role in establishing the institute that metamorphosed into the insurance training college that we have today. Sevana played a very big role in building a strong association of insurers. He is credited for having established several insurance firms in the different areas, and these have since employed many Ugandans. Sevana mentored many of the insurance captains that we have in the insurance sector today. It is therefore important that we keep celebrating such a man. But as we celebrate Sevana, we commemorate the great contributions, and from them, we draw motivation and inspiration. It's a reminder to our generation that the struggle to take insurance to the top has not just started. The baton was handed over to us and we must pull our sleeves so that the efforts of the savannas are not wasted. The fifth memorial lecture is a special one as we thought of a talk that looks beyond insurance in our bid to reconnect with the insurance public. The fifth Savannah Chizito Memorial Lecture coincides with the Insurance Stakeholders Week that we organized to reach out to the different stakeholders of the college and the insurance industry. Sure. Yesterday, we are launching our corporate social responsibility campaign, which we are doing in tandem with the KCCA and the different schools that are within KCCA. Tomorrow, we shall be graduating over 1,200 students that have attained various qualifications through the college and we shall be crowning the day with the annual insurance dinner where we shall award and recognize the different members that have achieved different membership milestones. The different initiatives that we have put in this week resonate well with the works and efforts of the late Savannah Chizito. To that end, I wish to thank IRA, Al Haji, and the team for the continuous support you've accorded us and always guiding us in our different initiatives.
Thank you so much, Alhaji. I wish to appreciate the board of the college for the strategic leadership, and it is because of your efforts that we've managed to hold these events annually. Our dear keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Kasenene, thank you for accepting to come and have a discussion with the insurers. Thank you so much. Suiko, our key partners in organizing this memorial lecture and also the previous lectures, thank you so much and we appreciate this strong partnership. The staff of the college and all the participants that we have here physically and virtually, thank you for being part of this engagement. As I conclude, I wish to appreciate our membership for the continued support that has seen us grow from strength to strength. I wish to thank you all for being part of this engagement and I wish you a fruitful deliberation. Thank you all. God bless you for God and my country. Thank you very much, Principal. May I request you to invite the CEO of IRA, Al Haji, to address the participants. Thank you so much. Uh, it is now my singular honor to invite the CEO of the Insurance Regulatory Authority of Uganda to address this congregation. Al Haji, you're most welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the CEO of uh, Insurance Training College. Our keynote uh, speaker, Dr. Paul uh, Kasenene. The family of uh, Honorable uh, John Sevana Chizito. The chairman of the board of the Insurance Training College. and uh, board members of the Insurance Training College, the CEO of the Insurance Training College, CEOs of the insurance uh, industry, dear invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, partners and the media fraternity. Uh, to begin uh, with, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the, the, the CEO of the Insurance uh, Training College, we ought to get uh, a, 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 an apology from uh, someone uh, because we made an undertaking to start at nine and we started at uh, nine uh, almost 15. I know it wasn't your problem as the organizers because by the time I joined, I saw there were only 20 participants and uh, I can see now we have a hundred and uh, more than a hundred. But someone must apologize. Having uh, said that, which is uh, a courtesy issue, let me now go to uh, my remarks. May I welcome you all on behalf of the Insurance Regulatory Authority, and indeed on behalf of the entire insurance fraternity in Uganda, to this 50th John Savannah Chizito Memorial Lecture. I wish to extend my deep appreciation to all of you who have taken part in honoring the late Honorable John Savannah Chisto, who, as we all know, was a distinguished insurer, a businessman, and a politician. I want to applaud the Insurance Training College for organizing these, these uh, annual memorial lectures since we started, where this time around, the discussion is centralized on the insurance, health, and wellness. 
as we all know, this is a, sal a salutation for the legacy uh, left behind by the late Honorable John Sevan Achizito, whose resourcefulness was extraordinary that to date a monumental contribution of his, and indeed of his partner, Mr. Joseph Chiwanka, led to the establishment of statewide insurance company as the first uh, indigenous uh, private insurance company in 1982. Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to have a well-known wellness coach, Dr. Paul Kasenene, uh, to deliver the keynote speech in honor of our industry's guarantee soldier. There is strong evidence that investments in people like healthcare, education, and social protection are good for the individuals who directly benefit, but also for the country's growth and political stability, which we all know leads to economic uh, growth and poverty reduction. May I therefore say that it is important that today's uh, theme reigns very well with what we should do and we should always be thinking about in our daily lives. Nobel Prize winning economist Michael Spence, who is the chair of the Growth Commission, noted that health uh, dramatically improves our income and welfare. The Growth Commission report of 2020 concluded that investing in good health and nutrition in young children improves productivity and earnings of individuals and households with indeed strong implications for economic growth and in the aggregate uh, terms, uh, it improves the welfare of all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, health insurance is currently the fastest growing class of insurance business in Uganda. It has gained appeal for most corporate organizations over the years. And it is a strong employer's bargaining tool and has increased uh, staff productivity. However, we must also note that the uptake of health insurance in Uganda is still minimal. Modern the lifestyle, the food habits, the stress, and work-life balance have led to a sudden rise in the total number of critical and terminal illness among the uh, population in Uganda, and indeed the world over. In today's era, the medical expenses have skyrocketed and medical inflation is rising. A wellness program coupled with a regular health insurance plan offers relief and the comfort to the policyholders and to all of us. On this note, the Insurance Regulatory Authority of Uganda, working with the Ministry of Health, is spearheading the uh, development of the National Health Insurance Scheme, whose major aim is to protect Ugandans from unexpected and indeed many times high medical costs by allowing them to pay affordable premiums and get treatment when need arises. The authority is eager to see our life insurance providers indulge in innovative experimentation 
by offering medical insurance wellness programs on the medical insurance policy. Like when you purchase a health insurance plan with a wellness program, you are rewarded with some points for indulging in physical activities that keep you fit and healthy. And this includes streeting, running, jogging, cycling, walking, etc. And the end the points uh, can be used for some other activities which should uh, help all of us to be better and also to encourage us to uh, do more medical uh, checkup and also ensure that we remain healthy. May I therefore end my remarks with a quotation which says that do something today that your future self will thank you for. Bless or respect the health being of all of us that our future our future self will thank ourselves. I want to thank you very much for listening to me. We thank you so much, Al Haji, for your kind remarks. Our next agenda item is uh, highlights and resolutions from uh, the previous lectures. And as per the program, we had given it 15 minutes. But as highlighted by Al Haji, we've been delayed. So we'll try to squeeze it in, uh, in 10 minutes such that we catch up with time. And again, just re echo Al Haji's uh, Sabish words. On behalf of the organizers, we are greatly sorry for the delay in the starting this event, but we are hoping that we should be able to catch up before the agreed time. It is my honor to invite Mr. Solomon Rubondo to give us uh, highlights from the previous lectures, and then we'll dive into the next agenda item. Mr. Solomon Rubondo, it is your turn to give a presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, our keynote speaker, our regulator, our sponsors, the management and board of the college. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. And to put my submission into perspective, allow me to reflect on a challenge I had recently. My son has been following the ongoing discussions about climatic change. And he asked me that why is it our generation suffering the consequences of the mischief of our forebearers? The relevance of that question is to enthuse on the question that if the forebearers of insurance looked at the industry today, would they thank us for the job we have done or would they condemn us? The Sevana Chisito Memorial Lecture, therefore, as a phenomenon, provides a platform and a vehicle for us to wake up and refocus. And indeed, we have the message from our regulator to reflect upon today as we go into the discussion. It is the fifth. Today is the fifth occasion, following from the inaugural event, which was held in August 2018. This run under the theme, the future of the financial sector in a rapid changing global environment, focusing on insurance. The keynote speaker was uh, Al Haji Ibrahim Kaduna Birubega, the Chief Executive Officer of the Regulatory Authority. And in his keynote address, in line with the theme, highlighted one, that the marketplace is less mature and therefore presents great opportunities for new entrants as evidenced by the global figures then. For instance, the global insurance premium standing at 4.9 uh, trillion US dollars. Global insurance density 
standing at US dollar 650 and global insurance penetration at 6.13. On comparison, Uganda's rating then stood at a gross premium rating of $203 million against Africa's total return premium of 47, 47, uh, 48 uh, billion US dollars. Interesting to know that Uganda has since risen to over $300 million written every year. The density of Uganda at 5.3 then compared to South Africa at $842 and Kenya at 40. The penetration of Uganda at 0.81%, which has remained there, compared to South Africa at 13.75% and Kenya at 3.5%. Second observation highlight, the keynote speaker noted the existence of large and insured population, uh, population across the African continent. He also decried the low adoption of technology and the demand to design products that will appeal to the new br uh, breed of customers, the millennials, as existing products target mainly commercial and high-income earners. And the fourth highlight was the increase in insurance fraud, hence the inc resulting in the increase on premiums, thereby making insurance unaffordable. The session resolved that one, the need to adopt information technology strategy as a drive of insurance growth in the country. Along with this, insurers need to design products that suit the millennials and the new customers' demands. Insurers need to conduct technology leadership courses Insurers need to optimize data and raise process efficiency by widening cheaper and faster distribution channels. Insurers need, insurers need to embrace cyber insurance, which is among the fastest growing insurance lines in the world. The other resolution was the need to invest in research and development. The third, to increase the level of professionalism in the insurance industry through designing courses that suit the market demands, setting up a minimum, qualifi minimum qualification requirements for specific insurance jobs, embracing continuous professional development, and urged members to embrace the trainings organized by Institute, the Insu Institute now turned Insurance Training College. The fourth resolution was to lobby governments through local councils and municipalities and districts to ensure their assets. The fifth resolution to design policies that suit the low income earners, that is micro insurance products, and the wider uninsured persons. The sixth was the need to invest in insurance awareness and consumer education about insurance services. And finally, to consider the untapped insurable areas such as health insurance and micro insurance. The second memorial lecture hosted in August 2019 was held under the theme, The Emerging Trends in the Insurance Sector. We were honored to have OHT Charles Peter Maiga the Katikiro as a guest of honor and a keynote speaker, Ms. Patin K. Martin, the chairperson then of the Organization of the Eastern and Southern African Insurers. The concerns then were the embracing technology, client centralism, centrism, and innovation. Second, I need to devise new ways of addressing disruptions, that is developing, te developing uh, tailor-suit solutions for markets, designing simple products with less underwriting requirements, embracing new distribution approaches to insurance, the need to consider multi-channel strategies and operational transformation. The third memorial lecture held in 20 2020 which was virtual because of the disruptions of the COVID pandemic, was held under the theme, Business Recovery and Continuity Amidst the Pandemic. The insurers, <clears throat> the insurer's role. As mentioned earlier, this was addressed in, uh, in Luganda, as highlighted by uh, Paul Alia. And the keynote speaker, the executive director of the Federation of Small and Medium Size, Enterprises, Dr. John Kakungulwa Lugembe, emphasized the need to develop insurance products that are more relatable to the small and medium sized division who comprise the greatest share of the manufacturing sector in Uganda. 
The college was applauded for efforts to reach out to the small and medium-sized business division. Again, he highlighted the focus that should be drawn on understanding the role of insurance so that several players can fully understand the compensation processes uh, without need to, and therefore, have recourse to where to run to, which doesn't seem to be working out. Products should be also be customized to suit the needs of small and medium-sized enterprises. As we talk about digitization, training and awareness should also take the same route. The other panelists included uh, experts, executives from the college, players, uh, players from the market, and indeed uh, the regulator. The key resolutions from uh, this talk was one, insurance should be at the forefront of business planning and undertaking of major business decisions. Two, insurers should adopt digitized mechanisms to address knowledge and service delivery gaps in the insurance sector, such as e-moto th e third-party payment and e-learning. E-moto third-party has since been launched. There is a third-party portal. Insurers should develop user-friendly insurance products, especially for the informal sector, to widen the sector coverage base. Insurance remains an essential service, and therefore the college is challenged to boost partnerships and carry on with training through the e-learning platforms in observance of the COVID-19 SOPs. Insurance companies are urged to strengthen compensation to further build trust in the industry. Insurers are urged to diversify insurance service delivery platforms such as bank assurance. Bank assurance today is taking root and uh, expanding the footprint. The lecture also resolved to further consolidate efforts towards insurance uptake in the SME sector and finally to adopt digitization in the insurance sector. The most recent memorial lecture held in 2021 was held under the theme, The Resilience of Business Enterprise, a Reflection on the Insurance Industry. The guest of honor was Mr. Ramadan Gobi, the Permanent Secretary and Secretary to the Treasury Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning and Development. And the main speaker was Mr. Manuel Katongoli, the Executive Chairman of CIPLA Quality Chemical Industries Limited. Other panelists included OHT Robert Wagwan Sibirwa, Second Deputy Katikir and Minister of Finance, Uganda Kingdom, Mr. Protazi Osani, Director of Planning Research at the Insurance Regulatory Authority, and Mrs. Irene Kego Oloya from Padre P Insurance Brokers, uh, who addressed uh, management and innovation as a critical factor. After the discussions, the key takeaways from this session was the, the realization of the symbiotic relationship between sponsors, investors in business, policy makers, and the public, and the customer as a critical factor for enterprises to survive and thrive. Second, that this relationship should be harnessed in the realization that all parties benefit from continuous existence of enterprise. Third, there is a jinx that very few enterprises survive beyond five years. However, the effective play of the above symbiotic relationship provides a strong foundation for resilience beyond a five-year period. Associations should strengthen their advocacy <clears throat> to ensure that policies pursued by government are not oppressive to their members. Good governance as a minimum standard in the running of enterprises, small or big, should be adopted. Technology and related advancements complement good governance. Human capital is, criti is critical in the success of entities, hence the need to invest in human capital <clears throat> for their long-term survival. The insurance sector has a very big role to play in enabling resilience of business through funding of enterprise, mitigation of losses, and through prompt and fair compensation. Custom education, innovation, delivered with care and empathy, cultivates a sense of belonging that endears clients to yearn for continued survival of the enterprise. And at that time, there were prominent exits of corporates from the country. 
and there was an imminent exit of more. The session observed that the impending exit of prominent corporates from my economy was a cause for worry, as it, as it portends massive uh, job layoffs, reduction in taxes, and disruptions in the supply chain. I have tried to live within the 10 minutes allowed by Mr. Katabalwa, but try to be audible enough that at least we can memorize what has been presented. I request the organizers to find a way, if need be, to avail this submission for further reading. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Solomon Lubondo. Indeed, you've given a You've, you've taken us through the journey and uh, the insights that you've given us reflect on what was discussed in the previous four lectures. And we're actually looking forward to adding on that pool of knowledge with the insights and the uh, resolutions that will be made during today's session. Thank you very much, M Mr. Rwondo. And uh, again, to your plea of having this, I'm glad to inform the members that all this information, together with uh, resolutions from other webinars, conferences and sessions are available at the college. We have a pool and uh, this can always be available to our members as and when need arises. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now going into the other segment of our program and here we shall have a, a presentation by the Suiko family representing uh, Honorable John Seba Nachizito. I know Mr. Jo the late John Seba Nachizito and Suiko were one and the same. But as uh, Madam Evelyn Kalvo comes in, who is the CEO of a statewide insurance company, we also have a member of the John Seba Nachizito family online. That's Nesai Chizito. And she's uh, thanking you all. She's representing the grandchildren and th she thanks all of you for attending this webinar and also appreciates the initiatives by the college to remember their late grandfather. It is now my honor to invite Madam Evelyn Nkalubo to address the participants. Madam Evelyn. Um, thank you very much. <coughs> the CEO of the Insurance Regulatory Authority, Al Haj Kadnabi Ibrahim Lubega, the keynote speaker, Dr. Paul Kasenene, the CEO of the Insurance Training College. Board of Insurance Training College, the family, and all the entities closely connected to the late Savannah Chizito and the whole of the insurance fraternity, you are almost welcome to the fifth John Savannah Chizito Memorial Lecture. In November 1981, the late John Sebana Chizito, that's a Ugandan businessman, economist, and a politician, together with business associates. That was Mr. Patrick Chuanuka and Mr. Joseph Chuanuka, pooled resources and started a statewide insurance company, which will, uh, I will abbreviate as SWICO, as most of you know it. Having pulled resources together to set up SWICO, SWICO's operations commence on the 1st March 1982, thus setting up the first indigenous private company. And ladies and gentlemen, when they talk bubu, they are talking Suiko. <laughs> this is an indigenous company, so support by Uganda, build Uganda. The late John Savannah Chizito, an insurance icon, was also the founding chairman of Suiko's board of directors and made significant contribution to the insurance industry with his vast knowledge, experience, and skills in the insurance practice. He also set up a reinsurance company, you can't believe it, but later decided to concentrate on the insurance company. He was also one of the brains behind the formation of the Insurance Institute, which later became the college as you know it today. He started these professional ventures at a time when most people were really limited in their thinking, all they knew was petty trade. It is therefore a great pleasure and privilege to have been invited 
to give remarks on behalf of the family of the late Sebana Chizito and also on behalf of all the entities which Sebana set up along the insurance lines and I'm from Statewide Insurance Company Limited, that's Swiko. While focusing, uh, on, while focusing on insurance, wellness, and health, as we remember and acknowledge the contribution of the insurance icon, the late John Sevana Chizito, to the insurance industry. Addressing myself to wellness and health, I think by now you are all familiar with Pfizer. This is one of the world's premier biopharmaceutical companies. The COVID-19 pandemic made Pfizer a household name. So I'll limit my definition of wellness for purposes of today to Pfizer. So Pfizer defines wellness as the act of practicing healthy habits on a daily basis to attain better physical and mental health outcomes to ensure that people not only survive, but thrive as well. The two facets are connected with an improvement in the physical health impacting the mental health and vice versa. Wellness requires an intentional and holistic approach and is reflected through different areas throughout our lives. I will apply the criteria used by the counseling center. You can look at wellness from so many angles, but I'm going to limit myself uh, by from the counseling angle. This, this is a criteria used by the Counseling Center of Rhodes College. One, physical, they, 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 when they look at physical wellness, this has to do with how much you feel, how well you feel physically. Are you fatigued, weak, stressed? Have you been able to sleep for three hours at the very least? Then there's spiritual will, wellness. This refers to your connection with your religion or your creator. Some people attain this through communities like church groups where experiences are shared and advice solicited. It can also through consulting a priest or a sheikh. Social wellness. As human beings, we are social creatures and isolation has a negative impact on our well-being. This explains why many people got depressed during the COVID-19 lockdown and needed to reach out to one another to maintain their sanity you remember at that time really social, the, so, the, 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 the social media was really working in overdrive and the kind of jokes that came up, yes, they kept you entertained. A social wellness is attained through a connection or human interaction with those that are important to us. There's also occupation wellness. There are people that attain satisfaction from their jobs or having a sense of purpose from a job. They also appreciate the structure that comes with work. Then there's intellectual wellness. This has to do with deriving satisfaction from mentally stimulating activities or skills, skills building activities. There's also environmental wellness. This type of wellness has to do with the environment around us, the outdoors and nature. This can extend to the people around us and even the ideas generated around us. There's cultural wellness. This can be derived from our cultures and tradition through stories and experiences with individuals. Then there's emotional wellness. This can be achieved through getting enough rest, slowing down or pacing ourselves in whatever we do, stepping back to share, thing, to share and think things through. The above can be facts through which we view wellness. One has to therefore be conscious and make the choices towards being well, considering the fact that making healthy decisions results into wellness. Then I'll also address the role of insurance in ensuring that wellness, in ensuring the wellness and health of the public. Literary insurance means undertaking liability as an insurer or a reinsurer under an insurance contract. This is a sector that impacts almost the entire sphere of life of an individual, ranging from safeguarding their property right up to their daily livelihood. Insurance therefore comes in to maintain this wellness through the several known life 
life and health products that it offers to its customers. We all appreciate the uncertainty surround, surrounding carrying out business, regardless of which field. However, insurance can, an, can en, enable an individual rest easy, even in presence of risks like theft or damage to property, or even accidents caused to third parties on business premises. An individual could take out a public liability policy. This protects against claims of personal injury or property damage that a third party suffers or claims to have suffered. As a result of their business activities, public liability insurance will therefore guarantee environmental wellness. Insurance can also protect the well-being of your employees by compensating them in case of injuries, not during the, got during the course of their duties. This can be covered under a workers' compensation policy. This reduces the strain that would have been impacted on the business and in the long run on the business owner as well. Furthermore, insurance is also capable of safeguarding your well-being, health, through paying your medical bills. We all appreciate that access to quality health care remains a big challenge for many Ugandans, especially in rural areas and the urban poor. The major aim for this health insurance policy is to protect Ugandans from the unexpected, from the unexpected and high medical costs by giving them an opportunity to pay affordable premiums and get treatment when they need it. Ladies and gentlemen, the list is endless when it comes to insurance and health. That's the way to go. The insurance industry stakeholders week. Yes, SWICO welcomes the idea and had actually pointed out that uh, we're hoping that it would be a, an annual event, but I'm glad to learn that it's going to be an annual event. The week has, a CSR, has CSR activities awareness programs, and these awareness programs include launching of a project of take, taking insurance to school children so that they are aware of what insurance is. And it also has, this is as part of a bigger project or a bigger plan of including insurance in the curriculum of primary and secondary schools. That's the way to go. If you buy a finished product, you will never get it. But if you grow your own, you'll always have it. So if we inculcate insurance in these young, young Ugandans, certainly insurance will be the way to go. We'll all be able to appreciate insurance fully. And at the end of the day, when they grow up, they'll be able to buy insurance. That kind of relieves the burden that one would have had. In this respect, SWICO pledges its support to ITC in future programs, especially geared towards the promoting and growth of insurance. As I conclude, I must say that savings alone are not enough to guarantee wellness and health. Insuring your assets with general insurance policies and life with life assurance policies is equally important. A choice to insure is no doubt a healthy choice towards general wellness and health. Ladies and gentlemen, SWICO will provide you with a shield against all insurable risks. Thus, with SWICO, you are sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Nkalvo Evelyn, the CEO of SWICO. Thank you for that wonderful um, insight about the contribution of Honorable John Sebana Chizito to our industry and the different insurance policies that we offer in the industry, particularly those offered by SWICO. Thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now getting into the last session of our memorial lecture, where we are excited to host Dr. Paul Kasenene uh, on the topic of health and wellness. My name is Sylvia Kajubi, and I work here at the Insurance Training College. And just very briefly before we invite uh, Dr. Kasenene, uh, Dr. Paul Kasenene is a Ugandan medical doctor, a nutritionist, and public health expert. He's the founder and chief executive of Dr. Kasenene Wellness Center, where he works as a senior doctor. 
he is well known to promote healthy eating, wellness, screening, and lifestyle medicine. Very passionate about natural and nutritional medical care. A member of the International Association of Wellness Professionals, the Institute of Functional Medicine, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, among many other member bodies. Dr. Kasenene has over the last five years, particularly when we went down into COVID, shared with us tips on how we can keep healthy and have good lifestyle so that we can live a long life. Dr. Kasenene, you're welcome. And just before I allow you to speak, I just wanted to give you an insight about the insurance sector as we go into this discussion of health and wellness. We are, have two faces of the industry that we look at. One, the workers or the employees within the sector. We have a workforce in the insurance sector of between 4,000 and 5,000 employees. And most of these are what we call foot soldiers. The insurance sector is largely a sales and marketing driven sector. And so we have people work day in, day out, and probably work stress is one of those things that we look at. And the other face is the public who come to the insurance sector for different policies of insurance. And of course, it is in the best interest of the sector that the public keeps themselves healthy and goes for good lifestyles, especially since we have seen a growth in life insurance policies. So Dr. Kasenene, you're welcome. And now I, I invite you to make the presentation to our audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Um, the CEO, IRA, Alhaj Kadunavi Luega, um, the whole ITC fraternity led by the principal and CEO, Mr. Sol Seremba, the CEO of SWICO, the board of ITC, the board of SWICO, all partners, all protocol observed. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to um, be here and give the keynote address on this fifth um, annual um, John Sevana Chizito Memorial Lecture on a subject that is very important to us all, insurance, health, and wellness. Um, I'll start by, you know, introducing myself as a medical doctor, although most people uh, consider me a nutritionist, and I really want to explain how, as a medical doctor, I ended up, you know, promoting and advocating nutrition and good health. So I went to medical school in 1999, and my goal was to be a pediatric heart surgeon. And um, when I finished medical school, I was fortunate to get a job in a HIV research facility that required me to sit a lot, and it was a desk job. And through this work, I found that over time, I began to experience changes in my health that were not really disease per se, but what we call dis-ease. Now, dis-ease really means that you're not sick, but you don't feel well. You know, so I was gaining weight, and I was starting to feel like my health is not so great. And I had an experience that changed my perspective on health. I went to see a doctor that I worked with, um, and I explained to him that I wasn't feeling well. And after a couple of tests, he actually told me that my blood pressure was going up and that I actually had high cholesterol. And I was 28 years of age. At the time, my diet wasn't so great. But what really struck me was the way our interaction was. Suddenly, I was a patient, and I wasn't the doctor. And suddenly, I was there being told that I need to start taking medication, particularly cholesterol-lowering medication. And he even mentioned to me that if I don't change, if my blood pressure doesn't come down, I probably will need to take blood pressure medication. Now, hearing that from a doctor, I had never 
experienced, you know, known what it's like to sentence a patient to a lifetime of medication. And that's what we do as doctors all the time. And here I was being told, you need to take cholesterol medication at age 28. And we are told that you have to take this medication all your life. So that was a very, you know, turning moment in my life. And I decided to go on a journey to ask myself, really, is this the best way? Do I really need to take these medications? Unfortunately, I met another doctor in the United States who mentored me first through change of diet. And my experience with him was quite transformational and quite interesting because I know I'm a big advocate for healthy eating on social media and you know through my practice. And many of the people sometimes feel that what I recommend is a bit radical. But I must say that you know I learned this from this gentleman called Joel Furman because one of the first things he asked me to do on my journey towards health was not to eat cooked food for seven days. Now, I know this sounds radical, and I know this is something that seems impossible. But I gave it a try, and it changed my life. Within five days, I was sleeping better. Within three months, my allergies, which I had struggled with all my life, had literally disappeared. Within one year, I had lost 15 kilograms. And most importantly, asthma, a condition I, have ha I had had all my life, seemed to just vanish. Now, this was very instrumental for me because I always knew that this was a lifestyle disease. I mean, a, a disease that I inherited from my mother, a genetic disease. But here I was one year later, and all my five inhalers had expired because I wasn't using them. That's when it dawned on me that you know, people go to doctors not to get medication. People go to doctors because they want to be healthy, because they want to be well. But what we tend to do as doctors is we tend to give medication to try and solve the problems our patients come with. And so I decided that the best way forward was to go on a journey to educate our patients and the people out there what is the best way to be healthy. And so I'm going to um, keep my presentation focused on five key points today. Um, the first is the rising you know, incidence of chronic or what we call lifestyle diseases. And um, before I get into that, I just want to engage the audience. And I'd like to give away a book. I wrote a book called Eat Your Way to Wellness. And um, I'd like to do a, just have a short quiz, you know, um, just to see what, how much information people have on wellness. And, and, and um, to take part in this quiz, you're going to have to get onto your phone. I don't know if the information was shared, Paul. Yes? Okay. So, I hope you can see the screen in front of you. I hope you can see Dr. Kassene in wellness. Um, uh, probably now you'll see a question, how are you feeling this morning? So, you've, if, if you want to take part in this quiz, you need to use the app Mentimeter, menti.com. So, if you're not already in, um, go to menti.com. M-E-N-T-I dot com on your phone. M-E-N-T-I dot com. And then put in the code 2346-5280. 2346-5280. That should get you in. Alternatively, you can just look at the code. It's right at the top of your screen just above the question, how are you feeling this morning? So, speaking of wellness, I'd like to know how are we feeling this morning? Um, this is just, because we're talking wellness, um, it will help us to just get a, a feeling of, of how people are this morning. Um, I can see so far we have um, most people saying they're just fine. Some are feeling great, energized. That question is really just to help us to get into the app to make sure that it's working well. Um, so that once we get going for the quiz, um, we know that everybody can actually take part. So, um, I'm glad nobody's saying tired and sad, which is good. So I'm going to just dive into the quiz. Um, but before that, I just want to hear from you. Um, what are your three main areas of concern regarding your health. Now, you can just type in any three things that are 
of concern to you regarding your health. Examples are there, fatigue, blood pressure, excess weight. We just want to get a feel from the, you know, the insurance fraternity. Um, what are the areas? Again, this is just to help us get a feel of the app, but also to help us understand um, what are the areas you'd like us to address in this session. Okay, so weight, excess weight, fatigue. So you'll be seeing the answers as they pop up on your screen. Um, the most predominant answers will be the ones that you see in bold. Okay, so blood pressure, excess weight, fatigue. These are the main areas that um, people are, okay. Um, stress. Okay, so thank you for taking part um, in sharing your concerns. We will take these into consideration. Um, but right now, I'd like us to just dive into the quiz. And um, basically, what you should see on your screen is, um, you know, um, you having to put in your name. I don't know if you've seen that. Have you? Yeah, just put in your name so that we can actually see who you are and know who you are. So I'm going to ask you five questions. Okay. And um, everybody is free to take part. There's only one correct answer per question. Sometimes we have everybody answering these questions correctly. And so the winner will be the person who answers the most correct questions in the fastest time. So the faster you answer the correct question, the better for you. Okay, so we're going to start with our first question. Okay. 90% of all diabetes is genetically acquired. True or false? 90% of diabetes is genetically acquired. Time's up. So, the answer is false. Congratulations. I'm glad we've got that correct, most of us. So, only 5% of diabetes is genetically acquired. 95% is actually because of lifestyle. Okay. So, um, let's see who is in the lead. Um, fortunately, I can't see very well from here, but I think that's Anthony Luwama. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so in the second question, which blood group is a universal donor, can give blood to all others? Is it O negative, O positive, AB negative, AB positive? The answer is O negative, correct. So, um, IT, could you help us with the pop-up that's blocking the... Yeah. So, no, that's fine, that's fine. So, the leaderboard, um, okay, we have a new leader. Um, I don't know who that is. Can Liam? Okay, Liam is the new leader. Congratulations. Let's see. Let's go. We have three more questions. Okay. Trick, a very important question. How many teaspoons of sugar are there in a 330 ml soda? How many teaspoons of sugar? Two to three, four to five, six to seven, eight to nine. Correct, it's eight to nine. Can you imagine that? There is eight to nine teaspoons of sugar when you drink a soda. Keep that in mind the next time you drink a soda. So, let's see who is in the lead. 
Is it Paul? Let's see. Liam, now we're going to see who the new leader is. There's going to be a new leader just now. Is that Marion? Okay, so Marion is our new leader. Two more questions. You still have an opportunity to win the book. Question four of five. Which of these oils or fats is not good for your health? Which of these oils or fats is not good for your health? Is it coconut oil, avocado, sunflower? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, most people say it ghee. Actually, ghee is good for your health. It's actually sunflower oil. Sunflower oil is actually high in omega-6 fats. It's actually not very good for your health. The rest of the oils there are good for your health. Okay. So let's see. Who is in the lead? You give up? <laughs> no, don't give up. There's still one more chance. Okay. Is that Rachel? Okay. Last question. Question five of five. How many hours is it best to fast each day? How many hours is it best to fast each day? Three to four, five to six, ten to twelve, ten to sixteen. How many hours is best to fast? The answer is 10 to 16 hours, 12 to 16 hours each day. So let's see who our winner is. <laughs> so it's actually good to fast for 12 to 16 hours a day. And we'll talk about that shortly. So um, the winner is Rachel. So congratulations, Rachel. Um, I don't know if you're online or where you are. We will make sure you get a signed copy of the book delivered to you. <laughs> Number four, the f we'll give a discount. <laughs> anyway, so like I said, um, we're going to talk about the rising incidence of chronic disease. But I wanted to start off with this quotation that good health is not something we can buy. However, it can be an extremely valuable savings account. I put this quotation here first because sometimes many of us, you know, we assume that if I have money, I will have health. And sometimes we also assume that if I have medical insurance, I will have health. Now, medical insurance is an amazing thing because it really helps us when we have unexpected situations. But health cannot be bought by medical insurance or money. What will help us is really making the steps to be healthy. And I think this was most notable during the time of COVID-19. Became, it became very evident that those who were healthier were those who were low risk for getting challenges due to COVID-19. Now, we are seeing a rapid rise of chronic disease, um, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, allergies, asthma, Plots. We have stories of people with unexpected deaths. You go to work, you're fine. In the evening, we are told somebody got a clot and passed away. This is the new problem we are facing today, ladies and gentlemen. For a long time, Africa was considered the place where infectious disease ravaged and killed people. Now we are seeing a rapid increase in chronic disease. I told you my story of asthma and high blood pressure and high cholesterol. But in this room, each and every one of us, everybody on this call is either affected directly or indirectly by one of these conditions. There are five important things we need to remember about these conditions. The first is they are all preventable. And so we must take that to heart that we can prevent these conditions. The second, and this is where insurance can be very important, is that many of these conditions do not have symptoms in early stages. That means you could be listening in right now and just because you don't have a headache, just because you don't feel bad, that does not mean that you're healthy. What we tend to see is things like high blood pressure, the first sign can be a stroke. The first sign of high cholesterol can be a clot. The first sign of diabetes can be a coma. So it's important for us not to judge our health purely by the way we feel. 
The third thing is these conditions can also affect our children. And so it's very important that if you have children, what we are going to discuss today applies to you. The fourth, again I want to reiterate, there are no spare parts for this body. It doesn't matter how much money we have. If your kidney fails, there is nowhere to get a new one. So we've got to take care of it. And lastly, we need to have medical insurance because when you do have an unfortunate event, medical insurance can help you. Now, I want to also highlight something that is extremely important, that our approach to health needs to be one where we do not consider health and medical care as the same thing. Medical care is what you go to when you're sick. Health care is what you go for to look for health. Why do I share this here? Because in order for us to win the battle against this chronic disease, we need to understand what is it that makes us unwell. Now, today, more than ever, I believe that the biggest claim for medical insurance is actually chronic disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, and things like cancer. But we need to ask ourselves, why do people get these in the first place? And if you look at the bottom of this graphic, you will see that the leading cause of all our health conditions is actually a poor diet, followed by stress, followed by toxins, followed by lack of exercise, followed by lack of sleep. Now, if we don't focus on the cause, we end up with conditions like high blood pressure. And unfortunately, we have a medical system where there is a medication for every problem. And I'm here to spin this upside down and say that symptoms and diseases are not bad things. They are actually here to show us that there is something going wrong in our body. And we actually need to figure out what is going wrong. I have often said that I do not believe that high blood pressure is a disease, and that has found a lot of resistance from many people. But that is true. High blood pressure is not a disease. High blood pressure is a symptom of resistance to blood flow. So think of water flowing through a pipe, and then there is mud blocking it. What is going to happen is the pressure is going to go up to try and overcome the blockage. Think of your blood vessels that have been clogged by cholesterol and fat. Your pressure is going to go up, not because you have a disease, but because your body is trying to overcome the resistance due to that. If we learn how to overcome that resistance, we can actually overcome most of these conditions. Now, I also want to quickly say that many of us sometimes believe that chronic disease runs in our families, like diabetes, like high blood pressure. What we now know is that chronic disease does not run in families. What runs in families is the predisposition, the risk. And they say that your genes load the gun, but your lifestyle pulls the trigger. Just imagine somebody has a gun in this room. It's only going to be harmful to us if you pull the trigger. Without pulling a trigger, a gun is not harmful. The same thing with our genes. Our genes are not harmful. But once you pull the trigger, then there will be a problem. So I'd like us to go to the second point, creating awareness. Because it's all about the choices that we make every day. And right in front of you, I'm sure, I hope you can all see the choices that I have placed in front of you. What choices would you make given this situation? Would you choose an apple or a cupcake? Will you choose to exercise or will you choose to lie down on the couch? It's very important for us to realize that this is where our health starts. Our health starts by the choices that we make every day. The challenge is that the consequences of our choices are not immediate. And so many of us will feel that the choices that they are making are oppressive or hurtful or inconvenient because they don't enjoy them. And many people will want to enjoy their lives by making the choices that you see on the right-hand side without actually thinking about the fact that there could be a consequence. Now, I want to show something, a picture of a comment on social media. Um, I don't know if everybody can see this or if everybody understands this. But in summary, the person here was saying, these are the things 
that Dr. Kassene and it feels bad if we eat. I don't know if that's the correct translation. Okay, these are that pain, <laughs> direct translation. Now, I want to say a couple of things about this slide. First of all, the person who will post such a slide is not sick. Okay? If you come to my practice, I want to tell you th an example of three things I saw in the last few months that would make you rethink this statement. A couple came from their honeymoon and the gentleman was 36 and the lady was 34. They had just come from Thailand, a good holiday destination. When they were there, they decided, you know what, we're in Thailand, let's go for a checkup. And they did. And what happened? They found that the lady had stage four breast cancer. Now, sitting in my office, this is not their sentiment. Because when you're told you have cancer, you want to live. And you're not going to say, these are the things that pain Dr. Kasenene. During COVID, a boy walked into my office after COVID. And he said something. He said, doctor, I'm in school with your daughter. My daughter is 13 now. At the time, she was 12. And in my head, I'm like, I think you're mistaken because my daughter is 12 years old. This boy looked like he was 18. But when I looked on the chart, he was actually 12 years old. He was 120 kilos and his mother brought him because he had high blood pressure and his blood sugars were going high. The third scenario I'll say is a boy, a, a friend of mine came in, not a friend, but somebody came in and said, you know, doc, when you were in S1, I was, when you were in S6, I was in S1 in Budo. And now he came in and he was just recovering from a stroke. Now I'll tell you, if you're in any of those three situations, you're not going to say something like this. Many people say this because they are not sick, because they don't realize that there's going to be a consequence for their choices. And I want to tell you that we're not here to frighten you, but to raise awareness and say that you can actually do something about your health. Many times, Christians, and I'll ask if you allow me to share this, many times I've had Christians in congregations say, Doctor, in the name of Jesus, that won't happen to me. By faith, that is not me. And, well, that is a powerful statement. I'm here to say that it doesn't work like that. If it was that simple, nobody would be sick. Because everybody would just say, by faith, I cancel disease. Isn't it? But they can't do that. Now, I'm not saying faith doesn't work. Faith is powerful. Faith works. But faith doesn't just work that way. Many times why we are sick is because of natural law. Natural law means there is cause and effect. One of the simplest laws that I would like to call to your attention is the law of gravity. So any of you who has faith, like we have just spoken about, I will ask you to walk outside and throw your phone up. And at the highest point, when you know gravity is about to start, say, I cancel gravity by faith in the name of Jesus. If the phone stays there or comes to your hands or does whatever you want, that's when you can say you have faith. Now, I know this may sound like, you know, we're going into, you know, uncharted territories. But even the Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, chapter 6, verse 7, I think. That don't be deceived. God will, be, will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. So really the whole point of this lecture at this point is to raise awareness and say, what are you doing to promote your health? And I want to quickly take you through a couple of things we can do to raise the level of our health. The first is I want to encourage us all to drink more water. The body is 70% water. At birth, it's about 90% water. Before you die, if you live into your 90s, it will be 60% water. That means most of your life, you live mostly as water. If you're not drinking enough water, this body cannot function well. So everybody needs to drink at least two liters of water. But better still, estimate your needs by getting your weight in kilograms and dividing the number by 30. So if you're 60 kilograms, two liters, 90 kilograms, three liters, that's how much water you need each day to stay healthy. Drink it not all at once, drink it throughout the day. 
in a hot climate like Uganda, you may need to drink more and let the color of your urine be a guide to you. If your urine is anything more than light yellow, you need to drink more water. I also want to encourage you to all get bottled water, bot plastic, sorry, stainless steel or glass bottles because pl plastic bottled water, which is um, better than a soda, sometimes the plastic can have an issue with our health. But, and also if you drink tap water from home, boiling is great, but I encourage you to filter your water as well because sometimes there's contents in our water that are not good for us. Then to eating a healthy diet. I'd like us to keep in mind that we are what we eat. I want you to think about your memory right now and ask yourself, is my memory good? Is my focus good? And then I want you to remember that all your memory cells come from what you eat. And then ask yourself, am I eating things that are making my memory good or am I eating things that are making my memory junk? Junk food equals junk cells. So it's very important for us not to think that what we put in our mouth is just for the pleasing the tongue. It has real consequences in your body. So I'm going to quickly share with you three principles to be healthy in terms of diet. The first is 90% of your food should be real food. That's a very simple principle, whole, unprocessed, unrefined. No more than 10% of your food should be processed or refined. These are the foods we should avoid that are processed and refined. The first, sugar. Sugar is the most dangerous thing known to mankind. There was a talk in 2017 in Kampala, a conference, and the head of AMREF said the world is not at risk because of terrorism or infectious diseases or warfare. It's at risk because of sugar. Sugar kills more people globally than anything. One teaspoon of sugar will suppress your immunity by 50% for the next six hours. If you're taking sugar three times a day, you basically have no immune system. Sugar is the leading cause of obesity, of heart disease, of memory loss, of dementia. Really, sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Don't you think this substance needs to be banned? I know that sounds radical, but it is actually the most dangerous thing known to mankind. Remember we talked about a soda. A soda has 8 to 9 teaspoons of sugar. A 500 ml soda has 12 teaspoons of sugar. The second thing we need to avoid, ladies and gentlemen, with all due respect, are refined grains. Grains are very healthy foods. Maize is a very healthy food, full of energy, nutrients, and fiber. But when you make posho, you take it to the maize mill, you remove all the fiber and all the nutrition, and you're left with carbohydrate. Carbohydrate is converted to sugar in the blood. Carbohydrate has much more sugar than table sugar. So refined grains will give you more sugar in your blood than table sugar. And because they are refined, they will spike your blood sugars. They will lead to obesity and storage of fat around your belly. We must avoid refined grains. White rice is a refined grain. Posho is a refined grain and a refined wheat. Refined wheat is bread, chapati, mandazi, samosa, pasta, pizza, cake, biscuits. Everything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you're thinking, but that's not true. There's a lot to eat. We must also avoid processed foods. Crisps. I won't talk about brands. Sausages. The World Health Organization has come out and said that processed meats like sausages cause cancer, especially colon cancer. We are seeing colon cancer as the second leading cause of death amongst cancers. We must not eat processed meats. Certain oils are not good for our health. In the quiz, we talked about oils, and many of us thought that ghee is the unhealthy oil. But actually, the unhealthy oils are sunflower oil, sunseed, soybean, corn oil, canola oil, and safflower oil. The worst of all of them is margarine, if it has trans fats. This is very important because we're actually seeing a rapid rise in diseases linked to increase in fats. Now, fat is not bad. But some fats are bad for your health. So why are these fats not good for you? Because they are high in omega-6, which is inflammatory, that promotes disease. So healthier oils are olive oil, avocado oil, almond oil, coconut oil, sesame oil, ghee, and butter. Ghee is not bad. 
ghee is made from cow's milk products, but it is made in a way that the fat is actually beneficial. Alcohol, there is no amount of alcohol that is considered healthy. But there is a safe amount. A safe amount is no more than two drinks a day and no more than six in a week, not six on a Friday. It's very, very important that we, we consider this because this is one of the things that is leading a whole uh, range of challenges, emotional, mental health, and is very addictive. The second principle is we must eat 50% of our food from fruits and vegetables. Our plates, half of them at breakfast should be mostly fruit, at lunch and dinner mostly vegetables. I would like to encourage us to eat this group of vegetables. It's called cruciferous. Broccoli, cabbage, sukuma, wiki, cauliflower. Especially if you're a lady. These group of foods balance hormones and prevent cancer. Broccoli extract is under study as one of the you know, four fronts in cancer treatment. If we eat more of these foods, our health will be great. I encourage you to eat this every day. Leafy vegetables that are edible, as long as they're edible in your culture, please eat more of them. Garlic and onions are a very important vegetable group. They contain sulfur compounds. One is called alinase. If you've ever chopped an onion and felt something sting your eyes, you know what alinase is. It's very important, especially for preventing blood clots. Now, we live in an era post-COVID-19 where the risk of clots has gone up significantly, either because of COVID-19 or some people are saying because of our exposure to vaccination. That is a very controversial thing. But what we have seen is that healthier people tend to have more adverse effects from COVID-19 because their immune system is good and the COVID immune reaction makes it worse. Mushrooms. Mushrooms are very good for health. Fruits are exceptional. However, a lot of people are saying don't eat fruits because fruits have sugar. I'd like to clarify this. The problem is not fruits having sugar. The problem is the way you eat your fruit. Fruit traditionally, if you think of a mango, was eaten in a mango tree. In a mango tree, you climbed the mango tree, you picked a mango, and you ate it in the tree with the peel, the pulp, everything. Today, you buy a mango, you go home, you peel it, you blend it, you sieve it, you add sugar, and you drink mango juice, and now you have something that is totally different from a mango. That mango juice is going to spike your blood sugar and cause changes that can lead to diabetes and all kinds of things. So many people are saying don't eat fruits. The answer is no, eat fruit, but eat them whole. Eat them with the peel and the skin where edible. And don't be afraid of fruits. It's also important to be extremely active because fruits give you sugar. If you're not active, then maybe you should eat less fruit. Eat vitamin C rich fruits to boost your immunity, guavas, oranges, many others. So 50% of your plate should be vegetables. Your plate should look like this. Half of the food on your plate should be vegetables if you want to live a long, healthy life. We live in a world that is very polluted, full of chemicals and pesticides, full of toxins that are increasing our risk for cancer. It's only vegetables that are going to reduce your cancer risk because they are high in antioxidants. Whatever your plates are like, ensure vegetables constitute a big part. The third principle is 90% of our diet should come from plants. Only 10% should come from animals. This is probably the biggest subject of debate in the nutrition space. I understand it's very confusing because my two mentors say different things. The first one says don't eat animal foods, eat very little. The other one says eat a lot. I'm here to explain this controversy. Animal foods are not bad for your health. We only need very little. Actually, they can be beneficial for weight loss in the short run. But in the long run, animal foods increase your rate of aging and increase your risk for kidney problems and cancer. So in the short run, animal foods are bad. In the long run, no. Now, I want us to understand why we don't eat animal foods. It's mainly because our digestive system is long and coiled and is more like animals that eat plants. Animal foods go bad after 15 hours. If you left fish on the table at home, instead of putting it in the fridge, by the time you get home, you're not sure that you want to eat it, isn't it? not a cabbage. Cabbage can be left out for seven days. Now, animal foods putrefy after 15 hours. Food takes 40 hours to go through our system. So 15 hours after eating animal foods, putrefaction will start. 
in your colon. We don't have as much acid as lions to digest animal food. So putrefaction happens. The more animal foods you eat, the more putrefaction, the higher your risk for colon cancer. That's a fact. So it doesn't matter your blood type. We need to think about this. It's not just protein. It's what does this food do to me? Animal foods are not bad for your health. You only eat them in moderation. My recommendation is no more than 300 grams a week. So a boiled egg is 50 grams and a drumstick is 100 grams. So in that situation, we are talking about two eggs and two drumsticks of chicken per week. That's all you need for your animal consumption. Anything more is too much. Now, I know people are going to say that's too little, but think about this. Many of us in this room, our parents, our grandparents, they ate animal foods once a week, maybe three times a year, isn't it? On Christmas, on Easter, and now some of us in this room eat animal foods five times a day. It's very important not to think of animal foods as just protein. Animal foods have real consequences on our long-term health. So I would like to encourage you to make this easier for you. Try and eat your animal foods only on the weekend. That way you find that you're not going to have too much animal foods. And when you do serve animal foods, do not serve as much as you see on your screen. Because many of us are actually eating too much animal foods. And, you know, even on Fridays, I apologize, this may not be sensitive to all religions. So, what are the best animal foods? White meat. Local chicken, fish, and eggs. Keep it local if you can, because broilers sometimes are exposed to chemicals, hormones, and things that may make them even more harmful than red meat. Bone broth is good. Molokoni is one of the types that is close to bone broth. And then ghee and butter in moderation. Avoid red meat. Red meat is beef, goat, sheep, and pork. You don't have to stop eating this, but you shouldn't eat this more than once a week. And remember, no more than 10% of your diet. Please do not eat processed meats. Processed meats cause cancer. Please do not give them to your children, especially to your daughters. Today we see that our daughters start their periods very early. The age to begin a period ideally should be 15 or 16. That's the age many of our mothers started their periods. If you're my generation in your early 40s, you probably began around 12 or 13. Now today we see 9, 10, 11. So why is the shift from 15 to 14 to 13 to 12 to 10 to 11 to 10 to 9? Because of rapid development. When you start your periods early, you have hormones in your system. That may seem like a good thing, but it's not. Because hormones that are not uh, interrupted by a pregnancy can be a problem to increase risk for fibroids, ovarian cancer, breast cancer. So we have people who begin their period at age 10 and their first child at age 30. Those are high risk for fibroids. So we don't, shouldn't glorify eating foods that are processed. Processed meats are very harmful. Sometimes the animal even died six months ago, was put on a ship from Australia, and now is brought to Uganda, and you're going to eat that. You need to ask yourself, is this something I really want to eat? Very quickly, talk about milk. Milk is a healthy food, but milk is designed for infants. Adults do not have a big need for cow's milk, especially because cow's milk is more suitable for cows. If you do want to have milk, I would suggest plant-based milks like soy, almond, or yogurt, ghee, the cow milk products that are much better. So as we, as we um, come to the wrap-up of this section on food, I want to just say, what should the other quarter of your plate be? The other quarter of your plate should be protein-rich foods. Remember, proteins don't come from animals first. Proteins come from plants. Most of you are thinking beans, but the best source of protein is spinach. If you watched Popeye as a child, if you know Popeye, then you know what age group I am. But there's a lot of protein in spinach, in cabbage, because that's where cows and goats get their protein. So let's get our protein from beans, from nuts, from legumes, and green vegetables. Carbohydrates are not bad, but ladies and gentlemen, we must move away from serving a lot of carbohydrates on our plate. Many people in Uganda say, I eat healthy, meaning they eat boiled food. But what they're saying is that I serve food like this. So what you see is really what people serve on their plates. What's the problem with this? It's 90% carbohydrate, 50% of which is refined. This is not good food to serve. Only a quarter of your plate should be carbohydrate-rich food. I urge you, please do not serve food like this or this. And when you go for a wedding or a party on tomorrow's graduation, Please do not serve food like that. So carbohydrates are not bad, 
eat colorful carbohydrates, I recommend sweet potatoes, pumpkins, yams, cassava, matoke. Eat gr whole grains, whole maize, millet, whole grain bread. Have your millet porridge. And at your break time, think of maize instead of having bread. The other principles can be got in my book. Because of time, we are going to have to jump the other four principles. But I want to just quickly come on to a point that is very important, managing our weight. I'd like to encourage each and every one of us to target to be within their ideal weight. The body mass index is the measure of what your weight should be based on your height. It is a simple calculation. Your BMI should be between 18.5 and 25. Now, if you want to know your ideal weight, okay, you get your height in meters. You get your height in, multiplied by your height in meters again. So like for me, 1.73 times 1.73, then times 18.5. That's the lower limit. And then times 25 for the upper limit. So 1.72 times 1.72 times 18.5 is about 55 for me, and then the upper limit is 75. So my healthy weight range is 55 to 75. Currently, I'm 66 kilos. So it's very important to be in your ideal weight range because once you're above your normal weight, your, increase, your, your risk for health challenges goes up. How do you get into your normal health weight range? Three things. The first is you've got to eat a healthy diet. We've talked about it. 80% of healthy weight comes from what you eat. Secondly, you've got to exercise. Now, many people make the mistake of exercising without changing their diet and get very frustrated. So you've got to combine both of them. And lastly, you've got to detoxify your body because toxins are stored in fat cells. If you want to lose fat, you have to make sure there are no toxins in those fat cells. How do you detoxify? Get fruits and vegetables high in antioxidants, blend them and drink them as smoothies, or go on a road diet like I went on in my first seven days of my journey. It's a very powerful thing to do. Seems extreme, but it's not. The person who mentored me, um, I asked that same question. That is indeed extreme to go for seven days without eating cooked food. And you know what he told me? He referred me to a quotation by a doctor called Dr. Esselstein. When a, doctor, when a patient asks Dr. Esselstein that question, this is what he answers. What is more extreme? To eat uncooked food for seven days or to eat junk, have your blood vessels blocked, then have to go to surgery. A doctor has to get an saw, saw open your chest, pull out your heart, go into your legs, cut open a vein, strip out that vein, take it into your heart, put it back on your heart, go back into your heart, sew back your chest together, and then put you on, on anti-clotting drugs for the rest of your life. What is more radical? So, I know that's a very tough statement to take, but that's what really is going to happen to us if we don't make our choices. Drink matcha tea or green tea. It's extremely important for increasing your metabolism and removing toxins, and that's why matcha tea is so great for your weight. Weight loss is possible. These are people who have gone through the journey, who thought that it was not possible. This is Andrew. This is Florence. This is Michael. Michael told a very fascinating story. We gave a talk at his workplace. And the day we gave the talk, he came and said, Doctor, I want to lose weight and I want to start today. It was a Friday afternoon. I said, why don't you start on Monday? He said, no, I want to start today. And I'm like, why are you so eager to start? He's like, I'll tell you when it works. Two months later, that was Michael, 20 kilos less. He said, one day I went to pick my daughter from school, and she said, Daddy, don't come into the gate. I'll look at the car, I'll look out for the car, and I'll come. And he said, why? He said, because my friends make fun of you. He says, they ask me, is your father pregnant? Does he have a ball in his stomach? And she's like, oh, he was like, he felt so bad that he decided to go on a journey. He went to the gym, exercised for six months, and didn't lose anything. But within two months of changing his diet, that was Michael. If you want to lose weight, it is possible. Get yourself a Nutribullet, a high-power blender. It allows you to transform all your vegetables and fruits into something you can drink that is smooth and tastes nice. If you need help with weight loss, we are happy to assist you. But I can tell you there is not one person in this world who is not able, who, is not, who, can, who can fail to lose weight if they do the right things. 
Wellness is more than diet. It also goes to physical activity and exercise. Some of my fellow panelists have talked about this. I want to just share this. Those of us who think we have no time for exercise will sooner or later have to find time for illness. If you think you don't have time for exercise, make time in your diary to be sick. That is a natural law. Exercise is not complex. Anything that gets your heart rate up, that makes your breathing up, that makes you sweat is exercise. Even walking is exercise. The recommendation is three hours a week. A week has 168 hours. Surely you can find three of those for your heart. Because if you don't, it's not going to be a good thing for you. We must start to stretch if you're past 40 years because our muscles and our joints become stiffer and we must build our muscle strength if you're above 50. I want to encourage you to learn to exercise at home or at work because many of us believe you must go to the gym. Unfortunately, that can be time-consuming in our very busy-filled lives. In this presentation, and I will share the slides I've put for you, two applications that are free of charge that you can actually use to exercise at home. If you work on a desk job, make sure you stand up every hour. Sitting is the new smoking. The World Health Organization says sitting can be worse for your health than smoking. Of course, if you do both, then it's a tragedy. I encourage you to get a standing desk so that every now and then you can actually stand up. That's a picture of my office. When I'm not seeing clients, I prefer to stand. Get a fitness watch to monitor your fitness activity or use your smartwatch to do so. It will help you to assess whether you're meeting your physical activity guidelines. This can be an amazing Christmas gift because this tool will really help you. I, I didn't believe in these tools, but it helped my mother, so I th thought I should maybe just share her story. My mother wouldn't exercise because she said, you know, we don't exercise. She had all kinds of stories. And then one day I told her that the World Health Organization guidelines are that you should take 10,000 steps a day. And she says, oh, I can easily do that. So I gave her a smart a, a pedometer. And the first day she took 1,500 steps. The second day, 1,700. And she was really surprised that she was so sedentary. So she vowed that she would never sleep until she makes 10,000 steps a day. I thought she was joking until one day my dad calls me at 9 p.m. and says, your mother is walking up and down the compound. And I'm asking her, what's wrong? And she says, ask Paul. So I, I, so I call her and I say, what's wrong? And she's like, no, I have to make my 10,000 steps. And to this day, she won't sleep until that pedometer hits 10,000 steps. That's an amazing thing you can have. And if you have the same thing, you're going to meet your physical activity guidelines. It's important to get time to sleep and rest. I think Napoleon Hill said that we'll sleep in heaven, or people say something like that, but I don't think that's correct. I think if you sleep less, then you're going to expedite your journey to heaven, and I don't think that's what we want at this point. You can't violate sleep. The body needs seven to eight hours of sleep each night. Continuous hours. Sleep is not just for rest. It's the time that your body heals and restores. If you want to prevent cancer and diabetes, you need to sleep. And healing happens between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. because our body follows the sun. Your body knows it's night, it knows it's morning. Healing takes place in the night. So when you're asleep from 2 a.m. to 10 a.m., you're not getting the same benefit as somebody who sleeps from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. So go to bed early and try and get seven to eight hours of sleep. If you're in a hustle like many of us are, please allow me to share one last verse. May I? Psalm 127, verse 2. The Good News Version says, There is no need for someone to stay awake very late at night or to rise too early in the morning struggling to earn a living. For the Lord provides for those that he loves even as they sleep. So ladies and gentlemen, make God your friend and you will find your health will be better. Lastly, emotional wellness and stress management. I think it's very important for us to realize that stress is a big factor in ill health. Actually, 80% of all hospital visits are related indirectly to stress. And so we need to manage our stress. We should, not, we should not thrive in stress. We should manage it. There are three things you need to do in stress management, and we can't go through all of them because of time. The first is you need to understand that stress is not the thing that stresses you. Stress is your response to the thing that stresses you. I don't know if that makes sense. Let me explain it a little bit further. Stress is, is the response, it's not the event. So if someone comes here and slaps me, okay, 
and I perceive this person to be a, a, you know, somebody with a mental health issue, I may not take offense. But if it's somebody who I think is not mentally health, not having a mental health issue, I may take offense. The response is going to be different to the same event. And so what I would like us to remember is that we need to change the way we look at the world. Because many of us are too ambitious. We are trying to do things that are beyond our means, eventually getting very stressed. You need to avoid situations that stress you. Because if you don't, then you're going to end up in situations where you're living beyond your means. And lastly, you need to find a way to release stress from your body. The top three are exercise, deep breathing, and saying thank you. When you say thank you, your body releases stress. Gratitude and stress cannot exist in your body at the same time. It is a scientific fact. So the easiest way to avoid stress is not to run away from it, but to say thank you. The fact that you can see me and listen to me and you can actually be on this call and you have a job, there's lots to be grateful for. Yes, there's going to be problems out there, but there's a lot to be grateful for. So exercise, take deep breaths and say thank you. Also eat for your brain. Because your brain needs to be fed the right nutrients in order for it to think well. Magnesium-rich foods, avocados, bananas, pumpkin seeds, spinach, beans, broccoli are very good for your brain. And then omega-3 foods like chia seeds, fish, egg yolk. These are also very good. We'll share the presentation with you. So we talked about gratitude, and so I'm going to end on that slide by thanking you for inviting me to be a part of this fifth, you know, late Honorable John Sevanachi Memorial Lecture. I want to conclude with a few remarks that all of us want to be alive. That's for sure. But to be alive, you've got to be healthy. And to be healthy, you've got to do the things that will make you healthy. There are three P's to health. The first is proactive living, which is doing what we've talked about. The second is prevention. Go for a checkup to make sure that you're well. The third is proper health care. When you're sick, don't go to the pharmacy. Go to the doctor. Make sure you get proper health care. We must develop tools in the insurance industry that will offer this holistic approach to health. Because many times our premiums are going up and up and insurance companies are struggling with more and more costs because people do not know about how to take care of themselves. Many people are going to the doctor at the first sneeze or cough because they are not educated enough to understand that insurance is not to go to the hospital every time you have a a headache. Insurance is for the unexpected. If we develop programs and products that educate our clients about what insurance is, especially in regards to medical care, then we are going to have less utilization. If we allow our products to focus on wellness and help people to have a healthier way to avoid blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, we are going to have people accessing medical services less. So this is something that is very important that the insurance industry should consider. And we're always happy to work on you with that in that regard. Lastly, it's also important to encourage your clients, especially when it comes to medical insurance, to set up workplace-based health programs that focus on wellness so that your people at the workplace can be healthy. And I believe ITC, IRA, SWICO, and all the partners We'll be taking up that initiative and we'll be very happy to support you. So my last slide is, remember your health is an investment. It's not an expense. And so we must take time to invest in it. You need to invest time, energy, and money. And this is something you need to tell all your clients. Investing in medical insurance is a good investment because eventually it helps you when you fall down a flight of stairs, even though you've taken care of your health. So if you want a copy of my book, you can call the numbers on the screen. Please stay in touch with us. Our numbers and email address are all shown right now on your screen. We will share them with the presentation. If you want, you can follow on social media, on Facebook and Twitter. 
I hope from today you will not throw stones and you will not give comments that life is short, doctor, <laughs> and that, you know, we all die. Um, please fair, share your feedback. There's a link. Please click that link. Please fill out the form. Tell us how you would like us to help you achieve your wellness goals. Thank you very much. I apologize for taking much more time than I should have. Um, I wish you a healthy day and a healthy week ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kasenene. I would like to uh, begin my emotional wellness journey by practicing gratitude and saying on behalf of our audience, especially our online participants, I can see we have over 170 online participants and the audience that is here in this room. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Very insightful presentation, very educative, informative, and also full of humor. So I want to thank you. Right now, we are going to spend the next 20 minutes going through the questions that have been posted through our chat. And Dr. Kasenene, uh, allow me to present maybe four questions at a time. The first one is, you have talked of um, blending uh, fruits or vegetables to make smoothies, uh, but there is a question, the blending, doesn't that affect the quality of the nutrients of the fruits or the vegetables? And then the second one is, what do we say about blue band or zesta when it comes to putting it on the bread for children? The third one is, you have encouraged us to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, but today we have seen a lot of spraying uh, of the crops in the gardens. How are we going to deal with the chemicals that come through the fertilizers and the pesticides when it comes to the vegetables and fruits? Then the last one is sunseed oil or sunflower oil. The doctors have now asked us to move from vegetable oil and recommended sunseed oil. So that is why the sunseed oil is now being bought more than the vegetable oil. But from your presentation, uh, you have advised us that sunseed oil is one of the dangerous oils. What is your opinion on that? Thank you. Thank you so much for those questions. Um, so the two things about food that people need to distinguish is the processing and refining. So processing means you're changing the structure but not the composition. So if you blend a fruit or a vegetable and you keep it whole, you actually don't lose any nutrients. Nutrients cannot be broken by a blender. They are very micro particles that, that cannot be broken by a blender. In, instead, sometimes when you blend, you actually activate many of the compounds. So blending is fine provided you don't remove any of the original component of the fruit or the vegetable. When you make a smoothie, it's important to keep it 80% vegetable and only 20% fruit. Because like we talked about, if you blend too much fruit, sometimes you have too much sugar entering the body too quickly. But blending is not harmful. I particularly don't like to talk about brands of products because you know these are people's businesses but margarine is not a healthy fat especially if it contains hydrogenated or trans fats so what i'm going to ask you to do when you pick up a brand of margarine pick up the container and look at the nutrition label if you see hydrogenated or trans fats or saturated fats that's a a sign to you that you don't want to buy that okay if it has unsaturated fats that are mono unsaturated fats or omega-3 fats then that's better unfortunately many of our products just say fat which is very hard to make sense of because fat can be good or bad but margarine in my opinion is not a healthy substance jam again is made with a lot of additives, flavorings, and colorings that make it quite unhealthy. So I would say be cautious. However, many people are now manufacturing healthier jams in a more natural way, 
those may be better alternatives. It's true that a lot of our food, our fruits, our crops, our vegetables are being sprayed by insecticides, herbicides, and this is making our food quite harmful for, our, for consumption. So my recommendation is threefold. The first is be a responsible consumer and buy from people who you think are not spraying as much. Usually, you know, small local farmers are the best bet. Um, secondly, try and grow your own fruits and vegetables. Have a balcony garden. I have one at home where you can grow your, a lot of your crops, your, your small vegetables that you use on a daily basis. That can really help. But for, thirdly is clean your vegetables and fruits as much as you can. First, rinse them with water. Let them run under a tap of water until any visible residue is off. Then soak them in water with sodium bicarbonate and um, apple cider vinegar. It really helps. Ultimately, we just need to create awareness and hopefully have better policies in place that will ensure that you know the government and regulatory authorities actually put in place policies that will allow us to have healthier produce. Because it's known that a crop should not be sprayed three weeks prior to consumption. Anything that is sprayed within three weeks is not good, but we are actually seeing people spraying crops the day before harvesting, even when in the market. So it's quite a, a very tricky thing, but individual awareness is important, and then a collective lobby to ensure that eventually we have healthier food on the market. Sunseed oil. So, um, there's been a lot of confusion around oil. People think, you know, plant oils are good, animal oils are bad. That's not true. It's the type of fat in the oil that is the most important factor. Now, the oils that I mentioned earlier, like sunflower oil, like soybean oil, like corn oil, they are high in omega-6 fats. Omega-6 fats promote inflammation. Inflammation is what drives chronic disease. Omega-3 fats, like in olive oil, like in avocado oil, they are anti-inflammatory, and so they prevent that. So just because a plant, an oil is plant-based doesn't make it healthy. And please do not be deceived by the word cholesterol-free, heart-friendly on vegetable oils. There is no cholesterol in plants, so that is an accurate statement. But they don't go ahead and say that the type of fat is, is, is unhealthy. Avoid buying oil in bottles that are plastic. Oil is affected by light. It, it oxidizes. That's why you usually find olive oil is in a dark brown glass bottle to prevent that oxidation. So it's important to, to have an understanding of all this. I don't want to make a pitch for my book, but in my book I really explain all these different factors about the oil, the good types, the types we should avoid. Because it's very important to be an informed consumer because many people are just blindly buying oils because they are saying sunflower oil. And especially don't buy oil if it's in a hard yellow jerry can. That one, um, please avoid it at all costs. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kasenene. We'll take another set of four questions. Um, someone is asking, but doctor, our forefathers had lots of cattle, used to drink milk day in, day out, and they suffer, never suffered chronic diseases like it is today. What changed along the way? Is it really the milk, or are there other factors? The second question is, are food supplements good? Because today we have seen, especially if I may speak for, uh, give myself as an example, the whale woman, uh, women as we get into the menopause stage. So are food supplements good? And then someone is asking, how can I overcome tiredness? At the end of the week, my body is so weak. How can I overcome tiredness? Then the fourth question is, how much can you emphasize the importance of doing regular medical checkups? And how often do you recommend one to have these? Thank you. Okay, thanks for those questions. Cattle, milk, meat. I get this a lot. So, the uh, first thing we need to understand is that um, the type of milk and meat that people eat today or drink today is not the same as the one that was drunk many years ago, especially for milk. Um, there's a lot more casein 
which is the protein in milk. There's a lot more additives. The processing, milk is just not the same. Um, the same goes with the meat. Now, like I said, animal foods are not bad. But it's also been known as a fact that any society that was predominantly um, hunter-gatherer or animal rearing, even though they didn't suffer chronic disease as much, they didn't live as long because animal foods promote acceleration of aging. So you can live a relatively disease-free life, not because the meat and the milk are per se the ones promoting your health, but also other factors that we don't consider, low stress, low pollution, lots of physical activity that they also had that counted, those also contribute. But animal foods accelerate aging. So you, if you want to live a very long, healthy life, then you've got to think of the things that will give that to you. And there are some areas in the world, they call them the blue zones. Unfortunately, they haven't studied any African blue zones, and I'm sure there are many, where people live easily into their hundreds, up to 120. Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Ikaria, Greece, Nicoya, in uh, Costa Rica. What they found is these people, all of them, consumed animal foods at most once a week, sometimes once or twice a month. So it's not that animal foods are necessarily bad for you, but if you want a long, healthy life, the less animal foods you consume, even milk, the better for you. But we should also remember that our forefathers had other factors in place that worked in their advantage. It wasn't just the fact that they were drinking milk or, or raising cattle. Um, supplements. In the ideal world, we don't need nutritional supplements. However, the world we live in is such that the food is no longer as nutritious, the soils are depleted, there's an excessive cooking of foods, refrigeration, storage, harvesting when foods are not ripe enough, excessive spraying, a lot of stress in our lives. So we find that the foods are not delivering as much nutrition as they used to, and our bodies are using much more. And so sometimes we are finding that people need a supplement to bridge the gap. A good example of a supplement that many people need is vitamin D. Vitamin D is the sunshine vitamin, but to get vitamin D, you've got to be in the sun. You've got to be, your skin has to be exposed. If I went into the sun right now, it's only my hands and my face. So how much vitamin D am I going to get? I spend most of my day indoors, so I'm not going to get enough vitamin D. So the solution will be a good quality vitamin D supplement. So supplements can be beneficial, but the word is supplement, not substitute. Many people want to say, okay, I want to eat my whatever I want, do what I want and take a supplement. That doesn't work. You still have to eat healthy and then take a supplement. Secondly, you have to take a good quality supplement. Many supplements out there are very poor quality. Price can be a good gauge, but that's not always the most reliable indicator. But not every supplement out there is good for you. For example, you have things like magnesium. There's six types of magnesium. There's magnesium oxide, there's magnesium citrate, there's magnesium glycinate, there's magnesium, you know, bisglycinate, chelated magnesium. All these are magnesium, but they're not the same. In your body, some are not going to be absorbed in your gut, so it's basically useless. So you need to get a high quality supplement and you need to get it from somebody who is knowledgeable. But remember, supplements are not, su are not substitutes and only for a short time um, in a year. But I recommend supplements, I use supplements because they can be beneficial, but they should never be a substitute. Um, people who are feeling tired, the first thing you want to do is change your diet, then make sure you have a good sleeping pattern. If you've, you've got to have a good sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene means you want to sleep around the same time every day and wake up around the same time every day. Seven hours of sleep is good, but if you're sleeping at 10 o'clock sometimes, midnight sometimes, one o'clock, your body will kind of get confused. So develop a good sleep hygiene pattern, then ensure you're eating well, and then exercise. Usually these are the first three things that will solve your problem. If not, you need to see a functional medicine doctor to see if you have a thyroid issue, adrenal issue. There are many things that can actually be a, um, an issue. Regular medical checkups are extremely important. I cannot you know, emphasize more how they are extremely, extremely important. 
Um, because the, first of all, like I said, many chronic conditions don't have symptoms in early stages. By the way, when you get a symptom, the condition is usually advanced. By the time cancer shows up because you have a symptom, usually you're in stage three, stage four, which is very hard to manage. So it's important to go for a checkup at least once a year. Some tests can be done once every two to three years, but I say go for a checkup every year. At the very least, go do your BMI, blood pressure, blood sugar, your cholesterol level, if you drink alcohol or liver function test. This should be your baseline. After the age of 45, for a man, you check your PSA and your cancer risk, but it's extremely important people should go for a medical checkup. And I would also encourage that the, maybe the insurance products should start to factor in some of these um, tests um, as part of the insurance package. It may make the premium go higher, but it will, it will save in the long run. Thank you. So I'll give you four questions and then a la and the last set of four, so those will be two, two rounds of four. Um, how best can we motivate our young children to eat healthier in this era where the processed foods are everywhere and peer influence is high? Dr. Kasenene, you know a typical school canteen, for example, has sumbusas, chapatis, donuts, you know, those are the kinds of foods. So how best can we help our young children? And are there any peer support groups where people like us or people who need um, to live good lifestyles and eat healthy and want to make changes to become healthier? Are there support groups which we can join to keep ourselves motivated? Then the next set is about uh, food combinations and it has a, it's a three in one. Um, Fruits after food or food then fruits, which is the order that is recommended? Cold water after eating food or warm water after eating food, for example, meat. Um, what is recommended? We've heard that if you take a glass of uh, a cup of hot water after a hot meal, probably people say you're breaking down the fats in the stomach. Eat breakfast as a king and slow down the meals as the day goes by. Is it something you'd subscribe to, to eat a heavy breakfast? Um, and then um, how best can we detoxify our bodies and how often? I don't know if I have given you so many. And taking supper after 7 p.m., you are recommended, recommending that we take our meals in moderation. However, we are also advised to stop eating at 7 p.m. So with your advice on eating our meals in moderation, would you still uh, advise me to have a meal at 9 p.m., even if it is in moderation, or should I stop at 7 p.m.? Okay, I can take those, and then I'll give you the, the last round. Thank you. So um, thank you for those questions. I think our children, it starts with our, us as parents, First of all, what we teach our children. Secondly, what they see us doing. Um, that's where it all starts. Children don't listen as much as they um, emulate. So I would say start by doing that. Um, many times I will have a scenario where a mother will come in with her children for um, nutritional guidance and she will, you know, in, in the child and say, you know, I told you not to eat this stuff and you'd like to eat it, and they'll get into some kind of mini argument. And I'll often ask the child to step out, and then I'll ask the mother, so where does your 10-year-old son get this food to eat? You know, you're, you're here arguing with them, you know, you're eating chips and, you know, you know, cake, but children don't buy food, they don't cook food, so I'm asking them, where are they getting this stuff? So you buy it, but then you don't want them to eat it, you also you hope that they'll eat the vegetables, so I think the starting point should be to educate your children. Secondly, have a discussion with them, not on the dining table, about eating healthfully, and then don't buy these foods in your house. Um, just keep them, let them know that they are okay to have them as a snack every now and then, out of the home, but not in your home. Peer influence is very powerful. My kids, by the time they are six, they eat healthy after that, then it's, it's a problem because they are in school and they get exposed to all kinds of things. 
But at the back of their minds, they'll always be aware that these foods are not healthy. So I don't stop my kids, for example, from eating unhealthy food sometimes, but I always ask them, is this food healthy or not? And they'll say yes or no. So at least they know it's not healthy. And that gives them the knowledge in the future to be more likely to make better food decisions. Of course, we need to you know, make uh, our schools more aware. We need to try and influence our schools to have healthier canteens and things like that. It's all a journey, but I think the best thing to do is to educate your children and be the example. Because if you're not the example, then it, it's almost impossible. Husband and wife, ma uh, you know, father and mother have to be on the same page because usually that's a big issue. You know, the mother, the, the wife wants to, the mother wants to eat healthfully. The father is sneaking in, you know, soda and things. Are, so those are the kinds of challenges people face. Peer support groups um, online. There are certain groups, um, healing naturally together by you know Christian Anumel. There are many groups out there where people will will support. We are actually going to be starting some next year. Um, to really help people to, to stay committed to their, to their groups. But it all be, it's all about mindset change. Mindset change is really where you want to start. And ask yourself, is this good for me or not? You know, the, the next time you have something, you're going to bite it. Just ask yourself, is this thing good for me or not? Believe me, you're going to eat less of it, you're going to stop eating it, uh, or you're going to think twice about your choices. So I think we need to really work on our mindset. Um, Food combinations are important, but they shouldn't, they shouldn't you know, baffle us and make us fail to, to, to uh, they shouldn't make us lose our peace. The truth is fruits are best eaten away, away from other foods. Fruits should be eaten before food, an hour before or two hours after. Historically, fruits were eaten in a tree. If you ate a mango, it was in a mango tree. You never went into a mango tree after lunch. You didn't eat your lunch and go into a mango tree. You went when you were hungry. So the stomach was all, always empty. So typically, fruits are eaten when, the, when, the, when you're hungry and when the stomach is empty. Um, but if you want to combine it with food, I would say have it before your meal and then wait a little while. Having a fruit right after a heavy meal is not a good idea. Cold or hot water after food, it's not a good idea to drink water after food. You need to wait at least one and a half hours or two hours after food. You can drink as you eat, but drink very little. If it's room temperature or lukewarm, it's fine. Very cold is not encouraged. My recommendation, therefore, is drink water 30 minutes before food, um, look warm to warm, and then wait one and a half to two hours after. If you must drink as you eat, very little just to allow food to go down your throat. But don't drink a lot as it can affect your digestion. Um, cup of hot water to burn fat, that's not true. Hot water cannot burn fat. You know, you know, fat, it's, most people assume that if I, if I get hot fat and I heat it, it just changes from fat to oil. It doesn't change it, its nature. So you can only change the structure of oil. Fat is solid, oil is liquid. So hot water will just change the fat from, the, from fat to oil, but won't necessarily burn it. So we shouldn't believe that you know, hot water can burn fat. That's not actually true. Um, um, detox. Oh, eat breakfast like a king. You know, there's a lot of, um, the information around food can be quite confusing. Historically, we had eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, I think dinner like a pauper. Actually, the best thing to do when it comes to food, first of all, is to maintain a 12 to 16 hour fast between your dinner and your breakfast. A 12 hour fast is basically 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. That's fasting. Better still, 7 p.m. to 11 a.m. My mother's aunt told me that's what they did when they were growing up. They had their dinner early because it was getting dark and there was no electricity. So by 6.37, they had their dinner, woke up in the morning, they went to dig before breakfast, came back at 11. So they typically had a 16-hour fast, what we call intermittent fasting today, which seems to be a modern term, but it's actually very part of our African culture for many, many years. So that's the first thing you want to think about. Now, when you break your fast, you don't want it to be very heavy. Because if it's very heavy, you're putting too much strain on your digestive system. So breakfast should not be heavy, but should be more water-rich. So it should have fruit which has water, a smoothie. Uh, if you're having millet porridge, something that is water-based should be part of your breakfast. And it doesn't have to be very heavy. It also doesn't have to be in the morning. Breakfast doesn't mean eat in the morning. It says break the fast. So you can break the fast at any time. It can be 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. I break my fast typically 10 to midday. So you don't have to eat breakfast like a king. Our research says that the heaviest meal should be around midday to two because that's when your body has the capacity to break it. Now, many people eat a lot in the morning because their bodies don't know how to use fat as an energy source. So typically, if I don't eat food for 12 hours, I no longer have glucose in my blood. 
So my body should start to burn fat to provide me with energy. Now, many of us, our bodies don't know how to burn fat. So by 8 a.m., if you don't eat food, you're weak, you're shaky, you have a headache, you're miserable, and so you find that you need to eat a lot in the morning. But typically, you should be able to wake up in the morning, have a glass of water, and be comfortable up to midday and use the energy that from burning fat. Then your heavier meal should be around midday to 2. So that's the meal that should be heavy. But even then, heavy doesn't mean a lot of starch. Heavy means more vegetables and, and less of the starch. So I would say the heaviest meal should be the one around midday to two. Breakfast should be fairly sized, but more water-based. And then your dinner should be the lightest meal of the day. Again, can I eat um, up to, up to, after, you see, ideally you should sleep by, nine, by 10 p.m. So you want your last meal to be at least two hours before you sleep. So 8 p.m. should be the cutoff point, ideally. Now, I do understand this traffic jam. We have busy jobs. Sometimes you've not even reached home at 8 p.m. Sometimes supper is the family meal. So where you have control, try and eat by 8 p.m. Where you don't have control, you can eat a little bit later, but then make sure your meal is not full of starch because then you're going to struggle with digesting it. So eating later can be acceptable if you're eating lighter. What I tell people is that if you reach home late, try and have an earlier meal in the day which is filling, and then the last meal, keep it light. But there are many dynamics around that, but I strongly discourage eating after 9 p.m. You'll feel more sluggish in the morning. You'll feel tired. You'll feel bloated. So eat less um, after 8 p.m. How best to detox? Detoxification is done in your liver. It's not something you buy. Detox is done in your liver, and it needs antioxidants, which come from vegetables and fruits. So to detoxify, you simply eat full fruits and vegetables that are high in antioxidants. The best way is to blend them and make a smoothie. If I give you broccoli, you may not be able to chew it, but you can blend it and make it into a smoothie, and it's easier to drink. So how to detoxify? I would say fast and drink lots of vegetable smoothies. There are certain herbs that help detoxification, like dandelion, like milk thistle, like turmeric, you can use those. So detox can come in various forms, but it's not synonymous with having a running stomach or colon irrigation. That is not detoxification. That is helping to flush out your gut, which can help detox, but typically is not detox in its own right. How often should you detox? I would say once a month. Go on a three-day juice fast or do something that is going to help your liver to flush out. Thank you. And these are the last four questions from our audience. Um, Kampala is heavily polluted. How best can we live in such a crazy environment? And then air fryers. We've heard of air fryers, and some, I think, are using them. And these are vis-a-vis -vis the deep fryers that we use to fry our foods. So are air fryers something or a gadget in the kitchen that you'd recommend since the frying of food is done with hot air instead of oil? The third question is what causes sleepiness after lunch and is it avoidable? So we usually have lunch and then feel very tired shortly after. And some employers are even giving employees opportunity to take a little nap but is it something that we can avoid? Then lastly, um, sunscreens, especially today there's a craze about sunscreens and different creams to try and keep our African skin as youthful as possible. What is the impact and what is your advice? Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's actually quite true. Kampala is a very polluted city. I think it was actually shown to be in the top 10 polluted cities in Africa or is in the world. So pollution increases your risk for lung cancer, for clots, and for other health issues. Unfortunately, you can't run away from you where you live. So what I would say is just live a healthy lifestyle so that you can actually detoxify most of the toxins coming into your system. If you can live in an environment with lots of trees and plants, that will also be quite beneficial to you. Air fryers are much better than deep fryers, definitely, because they're not using oil. You know, when you heat oil, the, 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 the changes that come with the increase in temperature are what are a problem. So air fryers, yes, 
are a much better alternative. An air fryer doesn't mean you don't need to use oil. You can use a little bit of olive oil or av avocado oil. Um, as long as you're using the right type of oil, that shouldn't be an issue. Why do people feel sleepy after lunch? That's because mostly because you're eating a lot of refined carbohydrates. So what happens is if you eat a very carbohydrate dense meal, your body is going to spike your blood sugars and insulin will be produced, which is going to have to bring down that sugar very rapidly. And so you're going to have a crash. So it's actually called crashing. And it happens about 30 to 40 minutes after lunch. It doesn't happen immediately because you've had a spike because of too much carbohydrate and then a rapid drop. So if you want to avoid that, you should have less carbohydrate and more vegetables. If you have more vegetables and less carbohydrates, it's, you almost never have that kind of feeling sluggish. But having that sluggish feeling is a sign that your metabolism is not great or you're eating too much carbohydrates. Sunscreen is mainly for ultraviolet protection because of uh, you know, the thought that our ozone layer is now perforated and there's ultraviolet rays coming in that can increase your risk for cancer. So sunscreen, to that extent, can be beneficial. Um, however, um, we, shouldn't have, we shouldn't be afraid of the sun because the sun is a very vital source of energy and vitamin D. But it is, we must be mindful that you know, because of uh, climate change, we can have a lot of ultraviolet rays coming in. As if for that purpose, I think sunscreen is good. For youthfulness, people are using anti-aging creams and things with glutathione and collagen. Those can also be useful to a certain extent, but you can't use, there are no shortcuts to health. You can't say, I'm going to use a sunscreen or a cream for my skin. You've got to, to follow the basics, drink water, you know, eat um, a, a, a diet high in healthy compounds that are good for your skin, and you know, exercise, detoxify. These other things should always be seen as supplements, things you use to just enhance but never as a shortcut. So let's keep that in mind. There's no shortcuts to health. You can't eat your way out of a bad diet. You can't say, I'm going to eat junk and then exercise. I'm going to eat well and then not sleep. You've got to find the right balance. But thank you very much for having me, and I hope it has been useful. <laughs> Thank you once again, Dr. Paul Kasenene, uh, with the over 150 people in our audience, online audience, and those in this room. I want to believe that the change is going to begin with us in terms of having a better healthy and wellness lifestyle. Thank you so much. Uh, right now, we have come to the end of our memorial lecture. Just two things to do. One. Um, is to give a vote of thanks to those that have uh, taken us through this day, this morning. I want to thank particularly our audience. Thank you so, so much, our online audience. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for keeping in, logged in for two and a half hours. Thank you so much. Swiko, thank you so much for sponsoring this event. IRA and ITC, thank you for putting this together. Mr. Rubondo, Thank you so much for being part of this program. Um, now, we are going to do two things. One, there will be a group photo that will be taken for those that are here, and then the online team. Please, you will be required to switch on all your videos for those that can put on their videos, switch on your videos, so that we are able to take pictures of uh, your attendance for today's memorial lecture. But before I close, tomorrow uh, the Insurance Training College will have its seventh graduation ceremony starting at 8 a.m. at Hotel Africana, and then we'll have a dinner still at Hotel Africana, our end of year industry dinner at 6 p.m., and you're welcome. Thank you so much, and this marks the end of the fifth John Sevana Chizito Memorial Lecture. See you next year for the 6th John Sevana Chizito Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Our online audience, can you now switch on? Online audience, please switch on.
our online audience, please switch on your videos and stay logged in until we are guided that they have taken the screenshots. Please switch on your videos. Thank you so much. Are we done? Thank you, our online audience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.